presentation looks at the role of RVTs, so registered veterinary technicians and veterinary technologists in cat and wildlife welfare. And it's brought to you by the Stewardship Centre for British Columbia. The Stewardship Centre's mission is to strengthen ecological stewardship in British Columbia by providing educational, technical and capacity programs and resources to organizations, governments, the private sector and the general public through collaborative partnerships. And thus, I'm bringing this message to you as part of their collaborative partnership approach to educating the public, as well as RVTs. So looking at cats in Canada, there's an estimated 8 to 9 million cats in Canadian homes, which is great. We love our cats. You'll probably hear my cat at some point during this presentation. One in three households has at least one cat. The good news is that an estimated 80 to 94 percent of these pet cats are spayed or neutered. So that's great news. However, just to note with this data, of course, it's dependent on those that replied to this self-reporting survey. So note that super important. It depends on the demogra uh, demographic that replied. And of course, <clears throat> the spay neuter rates rose with the income level of the respondents. So again, 18 to 94 percent of pet cats are spayed or neutered. That's a fantastic stat, but I don't think that it accurately represents all demographics across Canada. The bad news is that millions of cats are homeless. So this is a pretty big estimate, but it's that Environment Canada research estimates that there are between 1.4 to 4.2 million stray and feral cats. And that's dependent on the areas that they had studied in regard to these cat colonies. Cat welfare organizations give a similar estimate. And in Canada, humane groups that care for feral cats support on average 26 colonies with over 200 cats each. So that's quite substantial. When we look at birds in Canada, on average, North American bird populations have decreased nearly 30% since 1970. So grassland birds, aerial insectivores like swallows and shorebirds show serious declines. Habitat loss and degradation are likely the main reasons for the declines. However, mortality from collisions, windows, towers, vehicles, and predation by cats is also taking a large toll. So looking at the development for housing industry and agriculture, of course, that's going to lead to habitat loss that's often permanent. These factors that contribute to wildlife uh, population decline are generally irreversible. However, the bird mortality rates that are directly affected by cats, outdoor cats, is something that is reversible and we actually can prevent over time. So that's the take home message there. After habitat loss, cats are the number one human caused source of bird mortality, which is really sad to hear. If you know me at all, um, I don't know if you're just tuning into YouTube or if you know me through other sources, but you'll know that I'm a massive outdoor bird lover. I absolutely love wild bird populations. So it's really sad to know that cats, which I also love, are the number one <clears throat> human caused source of bird mortality aside from habitat loss. In Canada, cats, typically feral cats, are estimated to kill between 100 and 350 million birds per year. That is a wild stat. Looking at feral and roaming pet cats in the USA, it's estimated that outdoor roaming cats, mainly feral, kill an estimated 1.3 to 4 to 4 billion birds and 6.3 to 22 billion mammals annually, as well as amphibians and rest, uh, reptiles. Worldwide, overall, cat predation is the primary threat for 38 critically endangered species and has caused the extinction of 63 species. So looking at that, we have the threat for the 38 critically endangered species. So in Canada, of course, we look at the piping plover. And of course, knowing that cats have played a role in the extinction of 63 species. Also very important overall, we all know if we're in this industry, if we're veterinary technicians, veterinary technologists, if we're veterinarians, whoever we may be in the veterinary field, we've seen issues with cats who remain outside. We've seen those cats brought into the emergency clinics, those cats that have been hit by cars or otherwise. So we know that roaming pets face risks 
it's a cat welfare issue too. So yes, this whole presentation is to focus on the impact that cats have to outdoor wildlife, especially birds. However, the way that we can often access clients to change their behaviors and prevent cats from roaming outside is to remind them of some of the dangers and traumas and even just the challenges faced by cats who get to roam outside. So looking at cats that are outdoor, unsupervised, they're at higher risk of unwanted pregnancy if they're not sterilized, trauma from cat fights, injury or death from wildlife, getting lost, trauma and death from vehicles, diseases and parasites passed on from wildlife, and of course, ingestion of toxins. When we're looking at the type of cats who have the largest impact on wildlife, we're looking at feral cats in general. So feral cats, of course, as we know, if they're true ferals and they're not being taken care of by a colony caretaker, then of course, most often they're killing to survive. They're killing to support themselves and to support their litters. So feral cats, of course, kill more birds than pet cats, but both are a threat. So again, looking at some stats in Canada, these are estimated median numbers. Estimated free roaming cats is 7.5 million. And just looking at that pie chart of those free roaming cats, feral cats make up 37%, urban pets make up 44%, and rural pets make up 19%. Estimated number of birds killed annually by cats is 204 million. Again, these stats are wildly high. It's so sad to hear this. And looking at that, feral cats, so even though feral cats only make up 37% of the sort of outdoor unsupervised roaming cat numbers, they actually account for 60% of the birds killed annually. Urban pets make up 18% and rural pets make up 22%. So we know that, of course, feral cats pose the biggest danger to wildlife. However, outdoor roaming pet cats are thought to be responsible for over a third of, of birds killed annually. So yes, of course, feral cats are the number one, and I'm certain that you can understand why that would be. However, it's important to note that it's almost a third that we're looking at in regard to owned wandering cats or owned unsupervised cats outside that are killing birds. And then of course, we, we can imagine, I, I can imagine that you already know this data, but outdoor pet cats, of course, impact local ecosystems. Many pet cats are active hunters and roam up to 700 meters from the home, which is pretty impressive. So looking at this chart, or not this chart, this little uh, GPS picture, I love it because it's based on GPS tracking of one cat living near a seabird colony in Australia. So looking at the red lines, that's the daytime activity, and you can see how far that cat wanders throughout the day. Look at the, the nighttime, the nocturnal activity, of course it's less, as you can imagine, they're seeking safety and shelter in the night from wildlife, but look at the red, that cat goes far. So they've identified roughly up to 700 meters from home, these cats will, will roam. And if you've been to Australia, or if you know anything about Australia, they have a ton of issues in regard to outdoor cats and the impact that those outdoor roaming cats have on their natural uh, native species. So that's native birds, native small mammals, reptiles. They actually, they're completely devastating their native species. So I know that having been in Australia, it's quite a significant impact. And at least in the time that I was there, they had quite a significant amount of public education on maintaining cats as indoor pets only. And a survey of domestic cats on Phillip Island in southeast of Melbourne, Australia, has found that cats can roam six hours a day and regular, regularly wander up to this 700 meters from home. So it's pretty wild because I, I think about this in, you know, if I were to think about my own cat going outside, hanging outside, if he were missing for six hours, honestly, I would assume that he would just be sleeping under the deck, totally chill, totally relaxing. But what they found is in fact that they're wandering significantly. So looking at public awareness of the impact of roaming cats on wildlife, overall it's low. Only 45% of British Columbia cat owners, if you're not from Canada, that's a province within Canada, so 45% of BC cat owners agree that cats are a significant source of wildlife mortality. 
non-owners are even less aware of the impacts of roaming cats. This is overall, this uh, chart on the right is responding to the statement, cats are estimated to be one of the most significant causes of wildlife and bird deaths in Canada. So looking at that, there's a study, it's the University of Georgia Kitty Cam, also best name for a study, but the Kitty Cam study showed that cats only break home roughly 25% of their prey. So 25% of what they've preyed upon and killed. So I know that as cat owners, if we have outdoor cats, we always have those anecdotal stories about how the cats, you know, they bring home a chipmunk, a dead chipmunk, or they bring home a dead squirrel or a bird. Just <clears throat> again, going back to public education, it's really important to note that cats only bring home roughly 25% of their prey. So what they bring home, increase that by another 75%, and that's roughly the average total kill for the cat. So looking at this, the take home message is that public education is needed on the impacts of outdoor cats on birds and other wildlife and veterinarians and veterinary technicians and technologists can certainly mention the benefits of indoor life for cats and wildlife. Thinking about the health benefits overall for indoor cats has been shown to be a greater motivator for owners to keep their cats inside compared to hearing about cat predation on wildlife. So people, of course, are going to be more focused on why does it benefit my cat to keep my cat inside as opposed to your cat kills a lot of birds. Some people simply just, it doesn't affect them in the same way to hear about the number of birds that their cat is killing. Another reason we want to look at keeping cat indoors is of course our old friend toxoplasma. So looking at the parasites that cats are known to spread, which of course is a public health problem. So toxoplasma is a, it's a parasite, not a very nice one that people can get and cat feces deposited annually into the environment in the USA is estimated to have 1.2 million um, metric tons. So looking at that, <clears throat> this uh, soil that they had tested in the surveys, the oocyst density, so oocyst is essentially the egg for the parasite, was three to 434 per square foot and greater where cats were, uh, were selectively defecating. And unfortunately, as we know, if anybody either has kids or remembered being a kid and playing in sandbox, sandboxes, at least where I grew up, it was super important that we always, always, always put the lid on our sandbox at night because who would come over and use our childhood sandbox as a litter box? Every single neighborhood cat. So really important to note that we're looking at a public health concern in regard to toxoplasma. And of course, when we're looking at the types of environments that cats are defecating in, we're looking at gardens that people are utilizing their hands to sort of work with the garden and move the soil. And of course, we're looking at kid focused areas such as sandboxes. So keeping that in mind, super, super important. And because a single oocyst can potentially cause infection, this is a public health problem and certainly is a public health concern. Toxoplasmosis is also known as the kitty litter disease and it's the leading cause of infectious blindness in humans. And it can be fatal to fetuses, so individuals who are pregnant, and to people with, or and to people and animals with compromised immune systems. So again, there's other ways to contract toxoplasma. There's definitely some studies that support that undercooked meat is a primary way of acquiring toxoplasma as well. It's just important to note that toxoplasma certainly is uh, an impact on people or has the potential to impact people in a negative way. And again, our role with cats and the environment, we can reduce this public health concern. The other thing that's really important to note um, is that they've also found that toxoplasmosis is associated with mortality in marine animals all over the world. So there's a study by Lair that pointed to the example of the endangered monk seals of Hawaii, 11 of which have died from the disease since 2001. So it's interesting, and I, I believe I talk about this a bit later, but it's interesting because toxoplasmosa, toxoplasmosis is a widespread public health concerns, and they're just starting to uncover the true role that cats play with toxoplasma in the environment. 
So looking at this slide, of course, feline disease impacts the wildlife. So as I mentioned previously, the monk seals and toxoplasma has been implicated in infections of vulnerable wildlife populations all over the world. The parasite has been found in 44% of beluga carcasses in the St. Lawrence River and is a major cause of mortality in California sea otters. The cost of cats in general at large um, in the communities is a great one. So there's a significant cost that's associated with cats that walk around at large and live at large in our communities. So of course we have the potential for zoonotic diseases passed on by cats. So zoonotic diseases being those diseases that are transmissible to animals as well as people. We have the loss of birds and wildlife and we see here, this is such a sad picture, but it's a cat that's taken a baby bird from a nest or a fledgling that's fallen out of the nest. And of course it's, um, it will meet its demise. We have costly animal control, and we all know that in local communities, we have budgets for animal control, and some of those animal control methods are have greater endpoints than others, and we can talk about that a bit later. We have conflict and complaints, so neighborhood complaints, unwanted kittens, which might be euthanized in some communities that can't otherwise support them, and lost cats and feral cats, of course. So looking at the One Health approach, this is an approach that I really support. I think One Health is extremely important and it's looking at the role that works to attain optimal health for people, animals, and the environment. So it's looking at all of our health, the environment, the animals, the people within one umbrella. Veterinary technicians and technologists play a critical role in veterinary medicine and veterinary medicine overall, the way it operates at the interface of these three components. So looking at our role as veterinary professionals, we make the connection between cats, wildlife health, and ecosystem health. We work with community agencies and municipalities on local cat and wildlife welfare concerns. We encourage, or we can encourage early age sterilization, which I'll talk about a little bit, a little bit more coming up. And we can strengthen protocols to reduce unwanted cats. And we are a trusted source of information so of course, with our clients and potential clients, we can suggest the best management practices to these individuals. So the Canadian Veterinary Medical Association has released a position statement that supports the One Health approach overall. So the CVMA supports evidence-based, effective and humane initiatives to reduce the population size and impacts of free roaming, owned, abandoned and feral cats in order to promote animal health and welfare, public health and ecological and environmental health. The CVMA recommends that vets discourage the unsupervised roaming of owned cats due to the health and welfare risks to individual cats, their potential contribution to the stray and feral populations, impacts on wildlife populations, and the increase in zoonotic public health risk. Looking at a British Columbia veterinarian survey, there's results from this 2006 survey or 2016 survey of members from the College of Veterinarians of British Columbia. 91% of the individuals that were surveyed agreed that veterinarians play a role in helping to reduce stray and feral cat populations. And with this, I would argue, now my bias of course is that I am a registered vet tech, but I would argue that veterinary technicians, registered vet techs and vet, te vet, te eh, vet technologists would actually play a greater role than 91% or even roughly the same level of a role. The vet techs and vet technologists overall are the ones who are having those continued conversations with clients or the ones who see the clients at the beginning. We end the visit with the clients and their pets and we're able to really secure and cement some of these, these recommendations that the vet has initially uh, introduced to the owner. So I think that we play a very large role for owners of cats. 56% of the individuals surveyed reported that cat overpopulation is a problem in their community. Those in rural communities were more likely to think that overpopulation was a problem. And 70% perform early age sterilization upon request. So looking at this idea of early age 
sterilization. So why pediatric or early age spay and neuter is needed or recommended. 28% of cat owners allow their cat outdoors at some point in time. Cats are often not sterilized early enough to prevent pregnancy. So looking at that stat, we know that, I mean, it's extremely, it's, it's wild, but cats can go into heat at four months of age. It's rare. It's not that common to be that young to go into heat, but it can happen. And those are the only ones that we're able to track to say that it is rare. So with that, typically cats go into heat around five to six months of age. So we're looking at a cat that could be just four months of age, just a little tiny baby, 16 weeks old, who could go into heat, get pregnant, and then all of a sudden we have another 12 cats in the world. An average of 43% of cats in shelters are kittens, showing that a high number of cat litters are unwanted. And neutered cats have improved long-term outlooks since uh, being intact or pregnant is a leading factor in cats being given to shelters. When we're talking about these concerns in particular, then sterilization at an earlier age is better. Pediatric spay and neuters have significant benefits that are endorsed. They are endorsed by the Canadian Vet Medical Association. So looking at this, when we're looking at dogs, it's a very different story than cats. And of course, we know that with dogs, there's studies that are happening now to discuss the ideal age for spays and neuters for dogs and specific types of dogs and breeds of dogs. With cats, we see that there are benefits to early age spays and neuters, significant benefits. So early age spay and neuter before five months of age and pediatric spay and neuter performed between six and 16 weeks of age is considered the early age spays and neuters. There are, of course, some barriers to cat owners in regards to sterilization of their pets. So cat owners may delay or avoid sterilizing their cats if they're financially unable to cover the costs of the sterilization procedure. Preventing unwanted litters requires that financial barriers be removed. And if you've worked in the vet clinic, I know that you've heard from owners, from prospective clients, stating that you know money is the biggest barrier to their animal care. And it breaks our hearts because that's not what we're all about. However, of course, there is a cost to doing business. I can appreciate that. So looking at overall, if we can persuade owners to fix their cat, um, it's a number one priority for the BCSPCA who, along with municipal animal control departments, pay a high price for managing unwanted animals. So if you think about the impact that unspayed, unneutered cats have on the population of cats and the resources that SPCAs and humane societies and pounds have to invest in taking care of these animals. You can understand why engaging the owner, the new owner in a conversation about early spay and neuters is such a priority for these specific institutions. 90% of cat owners responding to the survey listed the cost of procedure as a barrier to getting their cat spayed or neutered. So of course, this brings me to the next slide, low cost spay and neuter programs are key in supporting the idea of overall population control and looking at preventing unwanted cat populations. Low cost clinics supported by municipalities, humane societies, veterinarians and veterinary technologists and technicians can improve sterilization rates and prevent unwanted cats. A study of low cost programs found that low cost surgeries at that as low cost surgeries increase, the non-subsidized surgeries also increased. So what they're saying is yes, those free numbers. So as those numbers of free spays and neuters continue to increase, what they found is that the regular price spade and neuters also increased in this, in this overall study. The general idea is that this was attributed to a public education campaign increasing the awareness of the benefits of sterilizing cats. Super, super important. The more we educate our pet owners, the more likely they are to engage in conversations with us about this and to engage in spay neutering for their pet. Also really important, just talking about getting those cats back to their owners. So sometimes, of course, cats that are outside aren't supposed to be outside and the owners didn't want them outside. And this is where permanent identification comes into play. The CVMA, Canadian Vet Medical Association, supports the permanent identification of animals and recommends a microchip using international standards organization microchip technology. 
So most of you watching this probably know that a microchip is a small little implant that goes underneath the skin in cats or dogs and it's scanned and when it's scanned it connects the the owner's information to that microchip number. So as long as the owner has registered the microchip, super important, then when the cat is scanned it can bring that cat back to the owners. About 70% of cats taken in by shelters in 2016 had some form of ID, but only 10% or up to 10% of cats in shelters are returned to families while 18% unfortunately are euthanized. Overall, Canadian shelters take in, take in approximately twice as many cats each year as dogs, and the majority of these cats are unidentified. So it's really sad stats. Overall visual and permanent identification greatly increases the likelihood that a lost cat will be re reunited with its owner. And that's the goal for microchip implantation. The use of collars and name tags in addition to a microchip is extremely valuable and it's generally underused. So note that a cat wearing a collar and a tag is extremely helpful along with a microchip. And then looking at sort of public perspective of the most effective practical slash popular solutions to reduce cat impacts on wildlife. So looking at the absolute most effective means for reducing cat impacts on wildlife, number one, and it's pretty obvious, it's keeping cat indoors. Number two, which I thought was really interesting because this is where we can play a massive role, is education by municipalities and humane groups. So if we as the veterinary professionals are able to supply municipalities and humane groups with information about the benefits of keeping cats indoors, then they're able to produce that at a public level in a widespread level. When we get to the most popular with cat owners, the most popular is of course spay and neuter uh, low-cost spay and neuter programs, which is understandable because we know that the uh, cost of spays and neuters is, of course, a massive barrier for cat owners to get their cats spayed and neutered, and bells or whistles for cats as well. So those are sort of some easy opportunities that are popular with cats, um, as well as education by municipalities and humane groups. Then when we looked at the most practical, we've got, again, education. <laughs> Keeping cats indoors is not as popular or as practical as it is effective, etc. So you can kind of see the difference between what is popular with cat owners, what's most effective, and what's most practical. Overall, public attitudes to keeping cat indoors, what they've found is that oftentimes public attitudes can be heavily influenced by the amount of public education and regulations through their municipality. So just to note, we're looking at Gatineau, Quebec, which is of course a city in a province in Canada, compared to stats in British Columbia, which is an overall province. So there's certainly going to be some inevitable differences just based on looking at the scale between these two pie charts. But looking at Gatineau, Quebec, the question asked, do you allow your cat outside without supervision? 25% said we, which of course means yes, and 75% said no. Whereas in British Columbia, 47% said yes, and 53% no, said no. And what they found is that Gatineau has passed a bylaw to keep cats from roaming off the owner's property. So only 40%, 48% of people with cats are aware of the regulation. The higher rate of compliance in Gatineau compared to BC suggests that these educational efforts and regulations can certainly influence cat owner behavior. The survey of cat owners in BC identified that the top reasons for allowing the cats outside, as identified by these owners, is number one, it's natural for cats to be outside. Number two, cats need the exercise. Number three, my cat meows to go out. Number four, the cat is destructive if kept indoors. So this is where we'll tackle some of those uh, concerns and how we can support that overall in the industry. This 2016 survey in British Columbia, most veterinarians advise clients to have indoor cats. So looking at this, the result is uh, to the question, do you encourage your clients to keep their cats inside? 79% yes, said yes, 21% said no. Top reasons why, 
safety for cats. So vets know that they don't want to see the cats gasping for air because the cat was hit by a car. They don't want to see the cat that's coming in for a pelvic fracture because they were attacked by a coyote. So looking at the safety for cats, that's the number one reason why the vets, and I would, I would generalize and say vet techs as well, why they would recommend this for cat owners. Safety for cats and wildlife was also a reason. Longer lifespan for cats and reduced disease risks for cats were all up there. Overall, life indoors is safer and healthier for cats. Life expectancy for indoor cats is higher, so 10 to 20 years compared to cats that are outside, two to five years. Cat owners are motivated to keep their cats indoors for health and safety reasons, rather than for concerns about wildlife. But remember that this is supported by the Stewardship Center in BC, so it's kind of like we're wanting to influence owner behavior to support birds, but we can also use this, we, we can use cat owner behavior to utilize different mechanisms of action. So I kind of feel like it's sort of an incognito method that we're going to utilize to help support the wildlife and ecological factors. Whatever the motivation, cats and wildlife benefit from preventing cats roaming at large. <clears throat> So looking at our role, we can help clients transition cats to an indoor lifestyle. And I, honestly, I think as an RVT myself, I think that this is really under discussed. So we need to focus more on the role that owners play and the role that owners can play in supporting a healthy and active and stimulated indoor cat. So we know that cats love being outside. Of course they do, but why do they love being outside? In part, it's because they have this continuous environmental enrichment. And I think that sometimes in our apartments, in our houses, we lack that opportunity for cats to have environmental enrichment. So looking at this as owners, we can, or as vet techs, we can support owners to encourage the opportunities of climbing perches all throughout the house. Okay, literally, as I was saying that, my cat just walked across my keyboard and flipped the slide forward. <laughs> my laptop is his environmental enrichment entirely. So we can encourage owners to investigate climbing perches, access to windows to allow them to watch and be enriched and engaged in that way. Cardboard boxes, cat toys, and scratching posts. I have a cat who loves cardboard boxes. So as soon as I buy anything online, which of course COVID-19 has greatly influenced my rate of Amazon orders, unfortunately, anytime I buy something online, I... I on purpose, I leave the box out for him for a few days. And every single day that I see it, he is in this box loving life. But we can talk to owners about that. Cats love boxes. Cats, a lot of cats love toys. And of course, they need scratching posts for their nails and for the health of their paws. Daily interactive playtime, we can do this directly with the cat. We can utilize automated toys for this reason. And with training, cats actually can enjoy walking on a leash or harness. That is not for everybody, definitely not for everybody, but older cats can be taught to enjoy going outside on a leash and adapt to life indoors as well. So just like dogs, cats need to have attention paid to them by their caregivers, and cats really benefit from these overall uh, opportunities for environmental enrichments, daily playtime toys, and the opportunity to climb. So this slide I love, because there's this whole concept of catios which are outdoor cat patios. And it's a safe space for cats to be outside, engage in their outdoor environment, be environmentally enriched, but be safe. So ideally cats have supervised or controlled access to the outdoors for fresh air, stimulation, and wildlife watching. Websites, there are many websites out there that provide tips on making catios and other ideas to transition from outdoors to indoors. So definitely the Feral Cat Coalition of Oregon, I think they are the number one in regard to catios, but they have, they're amazing, they sponsor a catio tour and they have how-to instructions and you can find that at feralcats.com slash catio dash resources or just Google the Feral Cat Coalition of Oregon catio. 
Another one to speak to is a this thing called the bird be safe cat collar. So cats wearing collars killed 19, these collars killed 19 times fewer birds than uncollared cats. And these are specifically, or sorry, specially designed cat collars. They're a massive conservation tool for owners who allow their cats outside. So just one thing to note that if the owner is engaging with their cat to utilize these collars, these collars, these bird be safe collars, they help reduce cat predation on birds, but they don't address the risk to cats roaming outside. So they're not gonna prevent the cat from getting snagged by a coyote. They're not gonna prevent the cat from getting hit by a car or otherwise. Also important to note that any of these collars, so collars that have bells on them can certainly reduce the risk of predation of birds. But these collars overall and collars that use um, high frequency sound to sort of deter that predation, they are only focused on working with adult birds. So it's really important to note that they do not protect against hatchlings or fledglings because those tiny little baby birds just don't have the knowledge to, or the ability to physically escape a cat. So even though they can hear the sound, they might not know that that sound is meaning that there's a predator coming. And then of course, they don't have their, their flight feathers yet. So they actually can't even escape those cats. So really important to note, they're also less effective, much less effective uh, for mammals that are being hunted by cats. So something that um, I engage in regularly, of course, is trap, neuter, and release programs. So I work with a lot of remote communities and as part of our overall practice and as part of our overall projects, we, we engage in trap, neuter, and release programs. So one thing that's important to note that unfortunately, TNR programs, when used alone, are ineffective long-term solutions in reducing feral cat populations. So unless there are resources to annually sterilize a majority of the cats or sterilize a majority of the cats in these communities, in these colonies, the colonies do continue to repopulate with kittens and as well as newly abandoned and homeless cats. So overall, what we're looking at is education in these efforts. So this suggests that all of these efforts without an effective education of people to control the reproduction of, of house cats, so looking at the avoidance of abandonment in cats, essentially could be considered a waste of money. So TNR on its own without education, without continued population reduction techniques, simply is ineffective over time. Super important, um, areas that it can work really well in. So for, and again, in conjunction with education. So I've worked with a number of <clears throat> communities who are island-based communities or are very, very, very remote-based communities. These communities tend to have a greater success rate in TNR programs if they work in conjunction with owned cats. So unsterilized owned cats being maintained as inside cats. Looking at options for feral cat management, because of course we want some solutions here. So looking at supporting TNR programs as a tool of a multi-pronged approach, that's really important. Support community education and bylaws that promote sterilizing owned cats. And of course you can always lobby or work with your local municipality to increase the awareness of the problems that cats have on wildlife as well as the potential risk for people to help get some of those bylaws in place. We can look at supporting low-cost spay and neuter clinics for low-income families or individuals, trap, neuter, and rehome feral cats, and establish permanent sanctuaries for cats that can't be socialized. So those cats that are the untouchable cats that simply would not do well in a home or even in a barn. Likewise, there are some opportunities to relocate colonies that are near natural areas of particular importance to wildlife. So overall, we can play a massive role. Uh, one thing, I can't remember if I was going to speak to it here. Uh, yeah, I'll go back to it, but about low cost spay and neuter opportunities. Looking at farm cats and barn cats encourage the sterilization, vaccination, and regular feeding of barn cats. It's really important. So looking at the predation of wildlife by local barn cats, it, it's very, very high. 
and a recent study of uh, cat predation of rats showed little impact on the rat population. So unfortunately, we, we get barn cats to help control some of the vernon that are vernon that are associated with barns. But what they found, the vermin that causes the most damage, the rats, if you've ever owned a rat as a pet, you know how smart rats are. So what they found is that rats very quickly learn to avoid being seen and cats concentrated easier on, or concentrated on easier prey. So don't kid yourself, most barn cats are not the best ratters. That's what we're often going to look for in Jack Russell Terriers instead. So what these cats end up doing is of course choosing the easier prey, such as the beautiful endangered barn swallows in our Ontario province. What can we do to improve the life for cats and wildlife? The burden of cat overpopulation shouldn't rest on cat welfare groups, vets, and vet technologists. It's a community-based approach and a community responsibility. So it takes a village. Include cats and local government animal control bylaws. So again, lobby or local, local municipal or provincial bylaw officers and uh, overall governments to support these bylaws. Advocate for local government support of humane shelters and low-cost spay and neuter programs and promote responsible cat ownership educational programs. Calgary is a model city for animal control. So overall they have a no roaming at large bylaw. Animal license fees pay for the no-cost sterilization and microchip services for cats and dogs of eligible low-income Calgarians. And there's a strong educational campaign overall uh, based on responsible pet ownership and bylaws. Feral cats are cared for by a coalition of non-profit organizations. So the Calgary model is amazing and truly is the gold standard in decreasing the sort of outdoor community cats that are either feral or owned and of course are impacting wildlife. Veterinary technicians and technologists have an important role to play. We can support the provision of surgical sterilization sur uh, services and encouraging early age spay and neuter. As a trusted source of information, we can recommend responsible pet ownership practices to clients. We can support the One Health approach, make the connection between cat welfare, community health, and ecosystem health. And we can work, work with community agencies and municipalities on local cat welfare issues. So we can really make this an effort of ours. And one thing to note too, I know that a lot of veterinarians tend to be turned off by the low cost spay and neuter uh, uh, clinics. So they, they tend to be turned off by that because of course they're worried about their bottom lines and they're worried about the profit loss because again, a vet clinic is a business. So a lot of vets are turned off by the potential for profit loss. If you put the mechanism in place, and especially if you're able to work with local municipalities to support low-cost spay and neuter efforts, if it truly is for individuals who are experiencing income reduction, whether that's because of COVID or job loss or simply other factors, if you're truly targeting those audiences, then remember that those audiences typically aren't the ones that are creating the, the profit, the margin of profit for your veterinary community anyways. So the individuals that are truly struggling with the barrier of the cost of spays and neuters tend not to be able to afford spays and neuters at a vet clinic at the regular cost. So the impact and profits won't be as high as some might expect if we're offering low cost spays and neuters. And then great opportunity for resources for vet technologists and their clients. Many websites provide professional expertise, as well as information for cat owners on feline enrichment for indoor cats and reducing cats or risks for cats and wildlife. So you can have a look at all of these amazing resources. And especially if you're thinking about developing a resource package for your cat owners to help support them in their enrichment efforts. If you are looking for printed copies, the Stewardship Centre for British Columbia has digital copies of the Happy Cat brochure, Cats and Birds flyer, and a veterinarian fact sheet available on stewardshipcentrebc.ca slash cats dash and dash birds. But for hard copies, as, meted, as mentioned in the title, uh, please contact them at info at stewardshipcentrebc.ca. 
And then just a big shout out, a big thank you to the funders and partners that make all this possible. Environment and Climate Change Canada has played a large role, of course, the Stewardship Centre BC and Partners in Flight have all played a very large role in allowing us to support our wildlife efforts through responsible cat ownership. There is a survey that's attached to this presentation. So if you're watching this and you're a Canadian resident, then I welcome you to email me. You can find my email in the comments below. And with that, by filling out the survey, again, Canadian residents only, it takes five minutes to fill out the survey and you could have a chance to win $100. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch this. I really genuinely appreciate it. And I hope that you take a little bit of a take home message about the impact that we can play in the veterinary field in supporting wildlife, as well as the overall ecologically or ecological environmental system and human and animal health through educating individuals about responsible cat ownership. Have a wonderful day.